Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm James Taylor. I've been working with CILT now for um, actually just over a year as their, their force manager. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll introduce a little bit more about the Institute and their role within force um, in a short while. But the purpose, really, of this presentation is to introduce FORS to you. Um, some of you are very familiar with FORS, um, others aren't. So it's really just to, to give you the basics, really. Um, it's quite a short presentation, but also if you've got any questions as we go along, uh, feel free just to find them by the way. Okay. So, um, what is FORS? It's obviously a question that comes up quite a lot. Um, and it stands for the Fleet Operator Recognition Scheme. And FORS is a national accreditation scheme for the fleet industry. And it's been going since 2007. Um, it started life in London, and specifically for the construction sector. Uh, but it's, it's, it's evolved since then. And over the years, it's actually developed into becoming less of a regional scheme and more of a national scheme. And it's really been focused on being a national scheme for actually about two or three years now. Um, so it's certainly well embedded across the UK. Um, and just a few bullet points here. Um, the, it's, it's really a summary. The, 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 the principal objective is to improve standards. So um, we're looking at fleet operators not just for HGV traffic, but we're also looking now at passenger and we're looking at bats. So it really does cover the fleet industry across the UK. Um, it's really about compliance and best practice. And when I say compliance, it's not necessarily about operator license compliance. There is a bit of a crossover, but not much. Because FORS really is a best practice scheme. So um, we, we consider that compliance, particularly O-license compliance, is your foundation, it's your baseline. Um, but what FORS is, effect is effectively a best practice scheme. And it looks at slightly different criteria. So principally, it's based upon safety, efficiency, and development. That's really what FORS is all about. Um, and we decided to come up with really just three basic criteria. Um, what's the objective for us in running FORS? And it's really to create a single standard for the UK transport sector. And, and, and really, that is our principal objective. Um, and this is why we want to develop it to become more relevant to PCB PSV. We want it to be more relevant to the van sector. Because we recognize that A, uh, there's nothing nationally uh, that really represents enough operators um, in, in those areas. So we really want to just sort of grow and expand on that. Um, it needs to be robust and respected by the industry. So absolutely we have to make sure that what we offer is relevant and it's what the industry wants. And also the standard that we write by which the operators have to meet has to be right as well. So um, we have a process which means that we get information from a governance group who say this I think is what we want this is what we think is relevant, this is where the industry is going. And we try and write that into the standard as best we can. So that's why we're trying to sort of make it as robust and respectful as possible. So how it works. <coughs> well, it's, it's a, basically a graduated scheme. Um, I'm not sure what's happened this time there, but I'll sort of read between the lines. Um, there are effectively three different levels of bronze uh, fours accreditation. Um, so a lot of companies register for FORS and they believe that their FORS are accredited, and they're not. Um, you have to obtain FORS bronze in order to be FORS accredited. And it's the first rung on the ladder. And we set the level of bronze to be, um, to be achievable. And the criteria is very much document-based. So when supplying evidence of bronze, more often than not, you have to supply, as an operator, you'd have to supply a series of documents. So do you have health and safety policy, for example? Um, as a general rule of thumb, and it's, it's a very generic rule of thumb, because there are some force auditors here, um, but in terms of the, how, it, how it works between the categories, I've always said that bronze, you have to show that you've got documentation, for example. 
There are practical elements as well, but it's, it's a documentation. At Silver, you're required to demonstrate how you're using that documentation. So what are you doing with the documents? What are you doing with the information you're providing? And at Gold, actually, what are you doing above and beyond that? So what are you doing to stand out as a best practice operator? Now, that is a very basic rule of thumb. But it, it's, it's quite, I, I think, quite good to sort of set the <coughs> foundation of the, the different levels. Um, the requirements are a mix of documentary evidence and practical measures. Uh, and they are categorised into four different sections. So you have, um, you have one section for management, you have one for drivers, you have one for vehicles, you have one for operations. And within those four categories, you have a set of requirements to meet as an operator. And we explain why you have that there as well. So we, in some of these documents here, um, we have the standard. So what, what do you need to do and why do you need to do it? We also have the guidance. How do you actually do it? And, meet. and it's very much an audit process of bronze. So if you're actually going for bronze, um, you have to get fully prepared and then request an audit, and you have an on-site auditor who, who comes in and delivers an audit, which normally takes <coughs> four hours, four to six hours. Four to six hours. Um, and they, they verify against the standard that you meet the criteria, and if you meet that criteria, then you get awarded for accreditation. Silver is slightly different. At silver level, you have to submit data. So actually, in the first instance, you have to start collating data. And that data is based on a series of KPIs. Um, you submit those KPIs through an evidencing system once every 12 months. And that maintains your four silver. At gold, and we have actually just changed gold, um, it's much more about best, best practice <coughs> and much more about being proactive. Just a few bullet points at the bottom. We launched version 4 of the standard on the 8th of November, um, which was coincidentally our first FOURS um, members conference, which was held in the Midlands. Um, and we changed the standard, and it took about four or five months to do that last year. And in, in doing that, we actually got advice from the governance group, we got advice from the industry, and got advice from the members. Um, and we introduced some um, PCB requirements because we realised actually the standard as it was didn't really offer the passenger sector <coughs> enough. Um, so in conjunction with CPT, um, who, who spent a day with us to, to give some guidance on what they think is relevant, we've introduced uh, only two or three um, PCB relevant requirements. Um, and we've made gold a bit more robust so, um, what's Falls focus on? Well, I mentioned before it started as safety and now it is um, continuing safety. Um, so, it, it began really with the interaction between construction traffic and cyclists. Um, but we're now looking at other areas. So, quite rightly, someone in the governance group said to us, well, okay, you've, you've looked at the urban environment, what about rural? So, what, what about um, high-speed rural roads, which are uh, notorious? So we're looking now at whether we can um, create something similar to what we've done in London, but for a rural environment. So we're, we're looking at whether that's possible. And actually, if it is, how do we do it? Um, but ultimately, this is what it's all about. So it's, it's about safer vehicles and safer drivers. Falls in the environment. Well, essentially, what, what we ask operators to do, for example, we require them to monitor their fuel of bronze. Um, but at Silver, we require them to actually be aware of their CO2 output. Um, so to, to actually take it a little bit further. Um, and this is all about really introducing basic principles of bronze, getting people familiar with those principles, and actually monitoring their own fuel consumption. And once they do that, then they're, they're actually going to be able to make the leap up to one, looking at their, their NOx and their PM and their CO2 a little bit easier. Um, so it's about familiarisation in the first instance. Um, but FOURS is becoming much more about the environment, and that's principally driven by some of the specifiers, the stakeholders, 
um, who have the objective to reduce down carbon output. Um, and it's also actually just as good practice. Um, um, and we look at root, rooting and scheduling as a, a basic requirement in bronze. And as a consequence of rooting and scheduling, or better rooting and scheduling, you get reduced fuel. And if you get reduced fuel, you get reduced emissions. And I've added this one in actually because, um, partly because a lot of um, a lot of pause is about the operators, but equally, it's about the specifiers and the transport planners. Um, so the local authorities have generally been quite slow to pick up on pause. We're, we're still banging at the door, but we're not really getting in. Um, and I think it's because that there's a, perhaps a lack of understanding, but also it's. Um, Pause isn't necessarily a long-term aim of a lot of local authorities and their, their strategy. Um, but there are real key benefits for local authorities. Um, and I've just <coughs> listed some here, actually. Um, but essentially, what, what Pause does is by introducing a set of requirements, you automatically have an operator who um, is, is performing better because they're more aware of the requirements. Um, some of the requirements include driver training, so again, the standards are improved, and if you have this, um, if you have this sort of spreading out across local authorities, inevitably what you end up with is safer roads. Um, and, and again, it goes back to the point about force being about safety. Um, and so we've tried to demonstrate to local authorities that there are advantages for them to become a specifier. Um, and there are some benefits to FOR's accreditation. And this is not particularly clear, but this is a, an image of a, a publication that we just produced that I haven't put it here with me. But it, it highlights the benefits of FOR's membership. Um, and principally, it's about funded training. Um, so there are, um, for example, there are two <coughs> driver CPC approved courses that FOR's Accredited members can have the drivers go on, and all they have to pay is the uploading. There are practitioner workshops. <laughs> there are practitioner workshops, um, and that is a new branding that we're introducing, which is called Force Professional. And the practitioner workshops are a series of nine workshops. Um, and if somebody actually attends all these nine workshops, they actually attain Force Practitioner status. We also, and it's not really clear on here, but we offer toolkits for free. So again, there are toolkits that again map across to, to the, the requirements of force. So you have a fuel performance management toolkit. You have a PCM toolkit, penalty charge notice. Um, you have free resources available as a force accredited level. Um, toolbox talks, we've just launched a new series of toolbox talks for drivers. Um, and again, they're, they're available Downloading, they're quite popular. Um, e learning, we've got e learning. We, we didn't actually think that e learning was going to take off, but um, contrary to what we thought, it has. And over 10,000 drivers have actually taken the FOR's e learning course, um, and it continues to grow. So we're developing the e learning courses as well, um, and that's an ongoing process. Um, we've got Van Spot Toolkit down the bottom. So there is actually a separate offering. Uh, for vans, or vans um, um, In terms of the membership, but this gives you an idea about uh, where we are. Um, I can tell you that actually we've reached 200 gold operators now. Um, but yeah, there's over 4,000 members, 4,000 accredited members across the UK. Um, now the, the vast majority of those are in London and South East, but as mentioned before, um, we have seen the growth in South Wales and various other areas. So can you search on the website, can you search them for an operator to see if they're always accredited? You can. And does it list all the board members as well? It does, yes. Yeah. And not only that, but you can actually look for drivers. So um, if you've had drivers <coughs> who've been trained, they'll be on the system. Mm. So when a driver leaves a company and just goes to somewhere else and he says, Well I've had that training, if you want to verify that you can on the force website. Um, so we, we maintain that. Um, so that's as of today, where we are with the members. And that really is an introduction to force.